Chicago, where we held the initial press conference at Gracie Mansion in City Hall. We've done it in, in the halls of Congress. Uh, right now, unfortunately, everything has to be online. And uh, that obviously itself is a contributing uh, factor uh, to uh, what we have put together uh, for, for this year. Just to quickly introduce my colleagues, uh, the director of the Digital Terrorism and Hate Project, uh, Rick Eaton, who's our senior researcher here for more years than he cares to remember, and uh, his capable associate director, Emily Thompson, both of them are uh, experts in this field and um, uh, help us put together this snapshot, which uh, will be the basis for presentations, including next month, uh, presentation again, unfortunately via Zoom uh, to uh, the uh, Congress in Argentina. And we have uh, a whole array of, uh, uh, of individuals, organizations and governments that are interested in the information. So first and foremost, we want to share it with the media and help you to get the word out um, and uh, have just the basic introductory comments uh, to make, make three or four points. And Rick, if you'll bring us to the uh, landing page right there to our uh, report card. When Rick and Emily finish their uh, presentation of the PowerPoint, we'll come back to this report card uh, based on 23 different platforms and we'll go through the uh, grading system. Uh, one comment that you'll see over here is that like my own report cards of yesteryear, uh, no one's getting an A or even an A minus and we'll delve into that uh, as well. Uh, look, this past year, we look at a perfect storm, a full year of lockdown from COVID-19 and the rampant conspiracies as to who was to blame originally and right up to uh, who's to profit or who profits from the vaccines. And uh, then also, as we speak, extremist elements of uh, anti-vaxxers uh, who continue to take that thread of conspiracy and overt hatred, including anti-Semitism and anti-Asian uh, attacks uh, on uh, social media. Uh, the second uh, point, a uh, second area which you'll be seeing soon and we'll try to roll out for you is that um, anyone who is following social media, certainly the way the Wiesenthal Center does, but I'm sure also uh, people in governments and media know that January 6th did not happen in a vacuum. The rhetoric that led up to it, the drumbeat uh, on social media, uh, both in mainstream, but primarily now in a subculture, uh, of uh, conspiriologists where you can, uh, they have their, many of their own platforms, uh, created that environment, pushed those themes. And what happened on January 6th uh, was basically uh, and frankly predictable and perhaps could have, been, uh, could have been stopped. The third point we wanna make is that the decision of the many of the uh, big five social media uh, companies uh, to enter politics uh, is a mixed bag to say the least, a slippery slope, uh, no consistency that we can see, uh, block uh, Donald Trump, but mainstream the Ayatollah Khomeini. And uh, to yesterday, I don't think you can see this, but I'll, I'll read it. This is at Twitter, uh, a tweet that was sent out by the foreign ministry of China yesterday, it came to my desk two hours ago. And there's never been any genocide, forced labor or religious oppression in Xinjiang. Then go on further to push the official Chinese government's uh, line, uh, which of course tragically is a lie, but a terrible, horrific tragedy for the Uyghurs and others uh, in China. No indication whatsoever that the, the Twitter has any intention of blocking uh, the MFA. And then uh, we have, we see some other examples in terms of extreme uh, rhetoric and extremists uh, pushing uh, people not to take any of the COVID vaccines. Uh, there's one the poll that says only 25% of African-Americans 
are uh, considering taking it. And yet, Louis Farrakhan's uh, call uh, to, uh, for Blacks not to take a vaccine that he claims is there to bring them harm and cause death is still right there in the mainstream of social media. Um, there has been a significant drop in our part of, the, uh, uh, of our research, as far as we can tell, a significant decrease in uh, Islamist terrorist related activity on social media. Uh, we expect that to uh, pick up again, uh, especially as ISIS is now finding traction uh, in many places in Africa. But in terms of this past year, uh, it has not played an outside role, which uh, we've uh, seen and detailed over the course of uh, two decades. Uh, the anti-Semitism, the anti-Chinese American and anti-Asian rhetoric is there. Uh, and um, my last point is uh, yesterday was the second anniversary of the Christchurch massacre uh, in which 51 Muslims were murdered at prayer on a Friday in Christchurch, New Zealand. Those murders were broadcast live via live streaming. Uh, the Simon Wiesenthal Center has been urging, you might say begging big, the big ones like Facebook to uh, take another look at live streaming and put in a delay system on all communications. Because as we know, the attempt on Yom Kippur in Germany uh, and elsewhere uh, in San Diego it is part and parcel of the game plan of extremists, knowing that they have that opportunity to quote unquote broadcast live pretty much anything that they do. And again, we think about January 6th, the mayhem there, it was all broadcast live. Maybe that was the right idea, but someone at each of these companies should be looking uh, at this um, uh, issue and we should move beyond a live, uh, you know, terrorist and extremist activity in your face, live and in color. With that, uh, let me uh, turn it over to my colleague, uh, Rick Eaton, to uh, give you a quick uh, uh, introduction into probably the 750 plus examples we have in the main presentation. Please unmute yourself, Rick, and take it away. I apologize, I have to uh, make this work. Okay, let's try this. So I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly, uh, but as Rabbi said, the, the, uh, this PowerPoint will be available to you with the imagery starting with COVID, uh, a lot of the things that we saw in the past year, uh, trying to weaponize the virus. This is a fake CDC warning that was uh, put out on Telegram. Uh, similar thing here, also trying to weaponize the virus. Uh, this, as Rabbi Cooper mentioned, the uh, social media posts of Louis Farrakhan and his Savior's Day speech, uh, not only this year, but the past last year on July 4th, when he when he was talking about the vaccine and on his uh, uh, digital magazine now still promoting this idea of not not taking it. Uh, <clears throat> this is an interesting one that came up just recently. This is a uh, a woman by the name of Su Susan Stanfield in in field in in Canada, uh, and she is a anti vaxxer anti masker who. Uh, is trying to compare her situation and the situation of, of her followers to, to uh, Holocaust related issues. So she created this, this shirt, COVID cost, uh, and uh, again, trying to compare her, her, herself and her followers to uh, uh, similar to Holocaust victims. Uh, another uh, posting from Anon Up is uh, again, talking just pure craziness. This is a COVID is actually a certificate of vaccination. And you see at the bottom later tagging you with a chip. They, people have been promoting this idea that uh, 
uh, they're going, the vaccine is actually a way to uh, microchip you uh, 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 because uh, Bill Gates uh, donated money to create the vaccines. Uh, also using, using Holocaust imagery to, to uh, uh, promote the, the, the context, the, 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 uh, the idea of, of uh, vaccinations and so forth. Anyway, you use that imagery, it's wrong. Uh, this is an interesting one. This doctor is actually calling it a, a and she's a, an osteopath, calling it a depopulation vaccine. And it's, it's actually designed to, to kill people. Uh, this is an interesting one from Czechoslovakia, a, a uh, youth group in Czechoslovakia. And the tweet actually reads, we will not be vaccinated against COVID-19. Let those globalist bastards blackmail how, us however they want. Here's the full image. Uh, and it says, get hooked. Just uh, before you leave, if you can go back to the last image, Rick, uh, that uh, horrific uh, caricature is exactly what the Nazis used. And so uh, these kinds of images are, are kept alive online. And here, without ever using the word Jew, uh, everybody gets the message, globalists, uh, and you know, a knife knifing someone, meaning uh, killing. It's uh, of course a far right group, and uh, just uh, horrific. With uh, it's a global. Um, this is also a global pandemic. We've seen it on the streets of Berlin and in other European cities with the yellow star. On the one hand, co-opting Holocaust imagery, and on the other hand, in this case, utilizing classic anti-Semitic stereotypes. Uh, and then this one, one of the many telegram feeds that, that uh, Corona Chan News actually targets both Asians and Jews. Uh, you see the, some of the imagery from that, from that feed. Interestingly enough, this character here with the antique cell phone is actually the character that Brenton Tarrant, the Christchurch mosque shooter, used on his, uh, on his Twitter feed before his attack. Uh, and then this one uh, comparing the, the uh, Chinese currency to, with, the, with the Jewish star. The star, David. Uh, Telegram still remains one of our biggest concerns. Uh, this, is, this is James Mason. He wrote a book called Siege. Uh, and you can see that the siege has actually been put part of it uh, online on BitChute, an alternative uh, uh, video platform, but Siege uh, is, is uh, kind of the, the uh, mantra for uh, the Atomwaffen division that you, you've probably heard of. They committed five murders across the United States and they have branches like this in other countries. This uh, actually, and you see down at the bottom, Siege joined the Fear Creek division, Fire War division. This uh, particular uh, telegram group was put up by a 13 year old in Estonia. Uh, and even though he was arrested, uh, his feed is still available. So you can, you can see what was on it, although it hasn't, he hasn't posted in close to a year. Uh, this is what a telegram feed looks like. You have the, the names of the feeds on the left and then the Adam Waffen division feed on the right. They can put, they can put hyperlinks and so forth. Uh, at one time, there were, there were literally a dozen or so groups that were spawned by the Adam Waffen Division. Many of those are offline now, but again, some of them you can still see what was posted. Uh, Adam Waffen Deutschland. Uh, they, Adam Waffen is now morphed and, and rebranded into National Socialist Order, who created, again, a feed on Telegram. And this particular image of the Capitol interestingly enough, was taken long before January 6th. If I can just jump in here again and say that this approach, if you can come back to the last slide for a moment, having the Capitol as the backdrop, uh, and you can see him wearing a flak jacket, et cetera, this is actually something that they learned from, uh, from Al-Qaeda and ISIS of using the backdrops of uh, capitals and well-known locations uh, in order to send a message. This is a message to their followers that the Capitol is a legitimate target for attack. Uh, other things that we've seen on Telegram is the deification of mass shooters. This is Dylan Roof from Charleston, South Carolina. 
with the uh, sun wheel, a, a replacement for the swastika in Europe, uh, 1488, the white supremacist mantra and Heil Hitler. Uh, and uh, same thing with Brenton Tarrant, and you see Roof and Adolf Hitler. Uh, and then also uh, John Ernest, the Poe uh, synagogue shooter down near San Diego. Uh, so we see, we've seen a lot of that. Also, this is interesting, a telegram feed, Iron March was a forum which uh, kind of was the predecessor to the Atomwaffen division. It's now offline. So this telegram feed is actually reposting the material from there, uh, pretty disturbing stuff. And uh, talking about the, the day of the rope, which will come into play in just a moment. Uh, Straight Arm Media, again, another telegram feed that uh, takes different online radio programs from extremist groups and makes them available uh, to, to uh, a, a larger audience. And then this one, Hola Hoax Memes, a common term for, by Holocaust deniers calling it the Hola Hoax. Uh, this is a telegram feed uh, as well. So there's, there's over 300 feeds we're looking at on a regular basis. We know there's hundreds more out there. Uh, but uh, it's, it's really uh, endless on Telegram. Uh, these three platforms, very popular with youth, TikTok. Uh, this is an interesting one. This is like a preteen kid who uh, had an affinity for dressing up in, in German uniforms and even uh, making jokes about uh, gas chambers as you see on the top right there. Uh, this was on his TikTok feed. Uh, and other, we see similar things like this as well. Uh, this is a uh, girl that, that's uh, 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 panting over uh, Adam Lanza uh, and other mass shooters such as Dylan Roof and Eric Harris from Columbine. Uh, another one uh, with uh, Dylan Klebold from Columbine. And some of these are offline. There's very similar ones that have, have come back uh, since. And then this one, uh, uh, which is still online, uh, uh, talking about things to do, one, two, 14 words. So 14 words being the white supremacist mantra, uh, we must secure the existence of our people in a future for white children. Uh, all on TikTok. Uh, these are various uh, playlists on Spotify. Uh, things like this, Mocking Anne Frank, there's others, others Holocaust denial related items. Uh, all, all available on Spotify. Uh, Discord is a gaming, is a part of Discord. It's a server that, that uh, kind of collates different things on, this, on the gaming site Discord, which has millions of users, uh, not only play games on the, on the uh, platform, but uh, there are forums like this that you can join uh, promoting the Klan, promoting white supremacy, Nazism, as you see here. Uh, and Gaming is, is a big recruitment, uh, recruitment tool for the, uh, the extreme right, especially as they've lost access to other platforms. Uh, and much of it is done within games where nobody can really monitor what's going on. Uh, uh, fake or real, we've got a lot of uh, items like this, again, using Holocaust imagery, uh, uh, you know, photoshopping the heads of social media companies into uh, into SS uniforms. Uh, uh, this one is uh, what something we see a lot of Holocaust distortion uh, saying Trump supporters are the new Jews, uh, uh, Jews in a new Holocaust, uh, et cetera. So this was, this was uh, also, this is uh, a post on Parler. Uh, another one which kind of flips the script and said that, you know, after we had an election and a peaceful transfer of power, it's saying, that, that transfer is actually, you're watching what happened in Germany. So it's completely flipping it over. Uh, this is actually a fake tweet that was uh, sent out uh, claiming to be Antifa that was coming to your neighborhood during the, the uh, protests last summer. Uh, it was later exposed as being uh, a, a far right individual that posted it. Uh, a similar thing saying they were recruiting protesters and paying them that was posted to Craigslist, uh, another fake. And then there's actual Antifa on, on this is a Twitter post from, from the base BK in Brooklyn. Uh, and 
Uh, so there, there's both fake and, and real. Uh, then this one was posted when, in LA when we had uh, a couple nights of unrest, uh, one particularly through the, the Jewish community in Fairfax, uh, Fairfax area in Los Angeles after a BLM protest. Uh, and the protesters started to move towards Beverly Hills. They, uh, the, the police there used tear gas to stop them. So this post uh, immediately came up uh, and you know, uh, instigating the, the anti-Semitism card uh, saying, you know, you city council people are Jewish and should know better. Uh, so going back about a year and a half before January 6th, we had these groups like Boogaloo that were uh, on Facebook and Twitter and other places. Uh, in many cases, they were private groups. You could see they were there, but you couldn't see what was going on. Uh, but they essentially were promoting a second civil war uh, and planning groups and so forth. There were dozens, if not hundreds of these on Facebook. Uh, and when you did see something public, it would, they were comparing themselves to the uh, Patriots of 1776. Uh, you also, and, and here you have once on Instagram and you had podcasts and so forth, all promoting this idea and planning uh, a, this second civil war. Uh, and then you also, at the same time, you had QAnon that was still on Facebook and Twitter, uh, uh, promoting the Q drops and their interpretations. And I won't go into the details of QAnon, uh, but uh, both of these were, were prominent on Twitter, Facebook, other sites, but very significantly, Facebook and Twitter uh, made the decision to, to ban these groups in the, in the uh, summer of 2020. And that's when they all moved to Parler. And uh, this is one of the posts from Parler. And uh, it, it looks like it may have been at, at January 6th or after. No, this was long before January 6th. Uh, many of these people joined Parler, as you see right on the screen, uh, right around uh, June and July of, of 2020 after they were banned from these other sites. Uh, and uh, using similar ideas as what uh, the terrorists, uh, the Islamic terrorists use with burning capitals and attacks on the White House and so forth. But this was posted long before January 6th. Uh, you had a lot of QAnon people on Parler. You see just some of the hashtags. There's one, the top one, 273,000 parlays or posts on, on about QAnon. So they were pretty active. You had the Proud Boys also very active on, on Parler before January 6th. Uh, and again, bringing back this Day of the Rope, which actually comes from the white supremacist novel, The Turner Diaries, uh, and the traitors who didn't support uh, the white revolution would, would face the rope. Uh, so just uh, 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 jump in here. Uh, we were in touch with Parler in real time, a relatively new uh, uh, platform. And uh, in fact, uh, Emily uh, signed on as uh, one of the uh, so-called judges that was supposed to be evaluating the problematic materials we sent them. And what I found to be quite uh, interesting is that their initial reaction, and we spoke to top people, uh, was similar to what we heard from Twitter mm -hmm. when they were first starting out, meaning we're not interested in censorship, we just want to give everybody a chance to uh, be seen and be heard. And uh, basically what we're telling them from our experience is that if you allow a part of your service to become uh, co-opted by extremists, uh, you'll, you'll find a, a huge, uh, you'll wake up one morning you know, with, with the kinds of materials that are being posted that you didn't go into business for. So you had postings like this and uh, a lot of hashtags such as hashtag civil war, civil war two, uh, where, where as you see 7,400 posts, uh, they were quite active uh, posting things like this, claiming that, you know, the laws, they, the, the so courts are supposed to, to support us. And if the courts don't support us, we're going to take uh, action in our own way. Uh, and this one, which just outright said, we need to go out after January 20th and start assassinating liberals. Uh, so this was posted the morning of January 6th. 
uh, and uh, as you probably know by now, they, they, this uh, sweatshirt was being marketed online on a number of different sites, uh, found to be worn by one of the uh, insurgents uh, inside the Capitol uh, on the 6th. Uh, and what's interesting, this particular interview that you've heard a lot about the, the, uh, uh, the Oath Keepers, uh, this is the leader of the Oath Keepers, Stuart Rhodes. He's a disbarred attorney. Uh, but but uh, very astute in law. Uh, and uh, he did this interview with the founder of Bright Dion, who's a strong supporter, uh, in early December of 2020. Uh, he claimed that President Trump should invoke the Insurrection Act and, and seize the voting machines and all the things that he, you know, have, have been under, uh, been contested over, you know, the time after the election. Uh, he was repeatedly claimed, we're already in a civil war, we need to identify the traitors uh, and the Chinese spies. And, and he finished with saying, you, will, you sweat now or bleed later. Uh, and he literally said in the video, we, uh, we're going to have a civil war and we don't expect to survive. Uh, as you may know, at least nine Oath Keepers have already been charged with conspiracy. A couple more were just arrested in the last couple of days. And I wouldn't, would not be surprised if they were charged with conspiracy or even worse. Uh, so in the aftermath of the sixth, Parler was deplatformed and we saw uh, these people going to different sites. This is uh, one called Cloud Hub, uh, uh, just uh, crazy stuff talking about all terrorist attacks or false flag attacks. Uh, again, this uh, doctor, uh, what this was a post on Cloud Hub, uh, this one, uh, claiming uh, uh, the Chief Justice, who because he didn't support them again, uh, he's part of some cabal that is is uh, torturing and, and abusing children, and that part of something called the uh, the Black Eye Club. Uh, and uh, then just outright things supporting the Nazis, trying to to uh, uh, you know claim that Hitler was actually good for the world, etc. Uh, the last one I want to show you is, is a non-up. This is actually, it looks like a travel site, but it actually is a social media platform for QAnon people. And right on the welcome page, they have all the popular QAnon hashtags, uh, WWG1WGA, where we go one, we go all. Uh, and again, we, we've seen a lot of these, these type of uh, postings here. You see that a non-up uh, looks exactly like Twitter. How they're getting away with that, I'm not sure. Uh, but what's interesting about this is it leads right back to Telegram, where they also have uh, a, a feed there. So Rabbi Cooper mentioned we're starting to see a, an increase in Islamist activity. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a Telegram feed that is an outright ISIS feed, uh, promoting ISIS, promoting jihad. Uh, bringing up some of the old videos and, and things from their, their quote, glory days, uh, and uh, also uh, uh, taking on Al-Qaeda, talking about their, they, they uh, uh, veered from the true path. Uh, this is a kind of a news site uh, that gives, gives updates on, also Telegram gives updates on jihadist activity, doesn't promote necessarily a philosophy, but it does give the figures of uh, infidels that have been killed and so forth. And then the last one uh, is a Sharia site, which is which is claiming that uh, essentially claiming that it is your duty to uh, to be at war with the infidels and 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 the like. So uh, the last this is the last site I want to show you one called D Live. As Rabbi Cooper mentioned, live streaming remains a problem. This is a platform that gives uh, access to, to uh, uh, many extremists to, to promote uh, their, their programs and you know, have their live feeds. And uh, just to give you an idea, these are, these are some of the figures that they were able to raise money from. And I'll turn it over to Emily just to explain how that works. Thanks, Frank. Uh, so as you can see on the screen, last year a report was released detailing some financial revenue that certain extremists had accrued using DLive. Uh, DLive is a video live streaming service, very similar to Twitch, popular with gamers. 
uh, that became popular last year in part with extremists who'd been deplatformed by YouTube. DLive uses a cryptocurrency called lemons, like the fruit, which can be converted to US dollars. And those lemons can be donated to creators or given to community channel users. Extremists have really been using platforms like DLive to access new and wider audiences and circumvent demonetization procedures, such as the banning of credit card processing for donations, loss of monetization through places like YouTube, banning from hosting websites on certain domains or using certain e-commerce platforms. We see that cryptocurrency is slowly becoming a viable way for them to accrue financial support. Uh, many extremists and organizations even have Bitcoin wallets, for example, where supporters can directly transfer money. While DLive has removed or demonetized several of these accounts, uh, users have already moved to other services such as Trovo and Entropy. This is a very live ecosystem and the extremists constantly adapt to new challenges and find new platforms. And last year, the Department of Justice seized approximately 300 cryptocurrency accounts used by Islamist extremist uh, organizations like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, which supposedly had uh, millions of dollars within them. So it's, it's not unreasonable to suspect that this avenue of finance is really one that the far right is actively and perhaps successfully pursuing. So I just want to show you these, you saw that the, the, the various platforms on the report card, a couple of these are included, but these are some of the newest platforms that we're seeing being used. They're not necessarily new to the net, but they are some of the newest ones being, being used by extremists that we're, we're now uh, keeping an eye out on. And uh, our, our, the whole report is now uh, live at digitalhate.net uh, and with that, I will turn it back over to Rabbi Cooper. Uh, thank you, Rick. Thank you, Emily, and for your amazing work throughout the year. Uh, you and your team globally were so grateful uh, for your ongoing commitment. Uh, let me make just one other uh, comment, maybe a piece of good news. We all know about the Abrahamic Accords and the taking down of uh, you know, virtual walls between uh, uh, Muslims, Arabs, Jews, Israelis, etc. Uh, we have been contacted and are in contact with a number of uh, folks in the Gulf region, in, including uh, from Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, we're hopeful that we'll be able to um, uh, hook up and work together uh, against extremism uh, of all forms. And that includes uh, getting a better understanding of what's going on in the Muslim world uh, standing uh, uh, with uh, our partners against uh, Islamophobia, and of course having them stand with us in the battle against uh, anti-Semitism. This kind of potential cooperation and actual cooperation was unthinkable, uh, you know, just a year or two ago, but it's one of the areas that we will try to pursue uh, aggressively uh, in the coming months and years. So, um, uh, Christina, I'll turn it back over to you. We have the uh, report card uh, that's um, uh, up there. You've uh, all been able to see it. This year, we also wanted to post the number of estimated users. The statistics really are stunning. And because we're all in lockdown, as we all know, social media is our lifeline uh, to our work, to our families. Uh, uh, to our whatever's left of our social lives. And that means that everything going on in social media, uh, its impact therefore is tremendously uh, heightened. Uh, and um, uh, one of the things also to, uh, you know, what do we do about this information? Obviously we share it in real time with local authorities or federal authorities when we feel it's uh, necessary, but also we have a growing uh, commitment uh, to uh, try to empower young people to deal with it. They're either the target of the hate or they're going to be seeing it and maybe being influenced by it. And um, the, recent, the Wiesenthal Center together with our Museum of Tolerance has uh, developed and begun to present uh, modules uh, into um, uh, schools. Uh, we expect to be in many New York City area schools in the coming uh, six uh, to 12 months to simply empower kids to understand you know, where the line is between, uh, you know, uncomfortable speech you don't like and hate or worse. 
Uh, and uh, since we can't stop the tsunami of hate totally, we can degrade the effort. We feel very strongly that all of us, uh, parents, the schools, uh, uh, all of us have to work together uh, to see to it that the kinds of moral decisions that need to be made as a result of, of what young people are ingesting doesn't fall exclusively on their shoulders. So with that, uh, we'll take some questions. Michelle or Christina, if you can help Thank us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, and uh, I know Michael Schwartz, Aaron Pandler with us today. Do, do you guys have any questions about today's uh, presentation or any of the findings for, from this year's report? Hi there, should we, should we just uh, unmute ourselves and do that or should I type them? What's best for you guys? Sure, Michael, go ahead, I can hear you. Hi, Rabbi Cooper. Uh, thanks again for this, the, the presentation. A question I have um, right off the bat is whether you have any mechanism for, for um, tracking how these messages uh, spread and the, and the reach they might have. Not, the, the messages, you, you, you pointed to some individual inflammatory messages as well as um, some accounts on Telegram and elsewhere that are producing this content. And, and I'm wondering if you have a sense or can give a sense of the reach of these of these messages. Is this something, you know, because some of them, at least you could get a sense from, from the slides that you provided. Some of them, you know, some of the some of the groups have have larger memberships than others. Some of the tweets, you know, are retweeted a few times. Some some are some or you know uh, some some have some have uh, higher engagement. And I'm wondering if there you you do any sort of tracking of this systematically. Rick, do you want to uh, uh, take a part of that answer? Well, I, I'm, unfortunately, there's not a real effective way, and every platform's different. So, as you said, we can see. Uh, we can see on Telegram how many how many followers groups have, and and frankly how quickly they grow. Like that that last one I showed the the uh, the QAnon uh, uh, site on Telegram that uh, you know only even started on January 20th and has uh, went from uh, 3,000 a few weeks ago to 14,000 subscribers uh, in the last couple of days, uh, but because of the different platforms, it's, it's, it's hard to, uh, to tell some platforms, like you say, will tell you when there's, when there's a retweet, but a lot of them don't have uh, too many statistics to work with. So it, it's a very hard, uh, hard situation to get a complete handle on. Let, let me uh, add a, a few points uh, to that. Um, in terms of impact, uh, first and foremost, for the true believers, in any of these uh, conspiracies or uh, you know, hate or terrorism, uh, the, the validation that's provided when you know that there are, in this case, Rick just mentioned, say 14,000 members, that also re, uh, sort of emphasizes over and over again, and maybe uh, over est estimates the impact that there are many, many people, sort of silent individuals or others who are with you. When you think about what was building towards January 6th for the true believers, many of those people believe they were gonna you know, save the United States of America, save the Republic, uh, save uh, the future. Those are the themes that were being uh, pushed over and over and over again. Uh, secondly, I think a lot of these groups also learn something, if you will, from uh, the international terrorists, which is you don't need large numbers in order to change history. You need devoted followers who are ready to, uh, to act. And of course, tragically, many of the attacks, whether it was the church in, uh, in West Virginia, the synagogues, Christchurch, uh, so-called lone wolves, it's probably a misnomer to even use that term anymore because these individuals all were swimming within these subcultures, uh, uh, if, you, uh, if you will. So the sense of empowerment, the sense of validation. And then the other part is that we were seeing almost immediately, we're now you know, more than a year into the lockdowns, we were seeing the conspiracy stuff against Jews and Asians almost immediately a year ago. 
uh, online. Those conspiracy theories were just dusted off, some of them going back to the Middle Ages, and applied to, in this case, to, to two groups. Um, and then you see the evolution, you know, the fact that social media sort of helped resurrect these uh, lurid conspiracies, uh, keep it alive. And then by the time we reach this year, with the help of high profile people like Farrakhan and, uh, you know, a grandmother looking like uh, a health person, uh, you know, telling you don't take the shot because you won't be able to have kids. Ideas that are otherwise, you know, just unthinkable permeate uh, social media in a year when we can have normal discourse and go speak with neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. So I think also the bottom line though, Michael, where you're heading is, how do you quantify the nature of the threat, its scope, et cetera? Uh, you know, what, can you use AI for that? That's probably for Homeland Security, CIA, FBI to look at, where in some ways our job is to be a little bit out front, look to trends, but I will say this, uh, you don't have to be in the FBI or Homeland Security in the last 14 months to see the, uh, this, you know, drumbeat on behalf of uh, so-called patriots, including neo-Nazis rebranding themselves, uh, et cetera. Uh, and it was just, it was February 2020, just before things hit, when I actually sat with the uh, then Attorney, Attorney General William Barr to discuss Telegram specifically with its hundreds of anti-Semitic channels. And our suggestion or request back then was, and I guess would remain right now, if I had a chance to be with the current Attorney General, to have a special task force uh, from the FBI to deal uh, with the anti-Semitism. And also since, you know, uh, let's say a VK.com, it operates and I think right now, partially from the Gulf, it started in Russia. Uh, I think that we may have to ask uh, the State Department, our Secretary of State, uh, to look at these issues and maybe also make it a part of our foreign policy when we're dealing with other uh, uh, governments, uh, when things are uh, parked in a specific location. Uh, maybe we may need to make it more difficult uh, uh, for the VK.coms and the telegrams to operate. It seems that whenever there's an expose by the media, you'll see a couple of thousand or a couple of hundred things being removed. But our grading system is based on transparency, consistency, and, and commitment. Uh, so that's a long answer to a very important short question that's going to, I think and hope, uh, become an important um, uh, issue and a, and a sort of a landmark, a guidepost that will guide uh, the uh, police and uh, intelligence agencies, and maybe also guide the internet community itself to be proactive and take action against it. Thank you, Rabbi Cooper. Does anyone else have any questions for the Simon Wiesenthal Center? All right, well, thank you everyone for joining. Again, we will share the presentation um, with you all right after this event. And um, thank you all for your time. Thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to working with you during the course of the year. And again, a special thanks to Rick Eaton, Emily Thompson, and my colleague, Michelle Alkin, and the entire, uh, uh, Christine, and your entire team over at Rubenstein. Thank you so much. No, thank you. <laughs> Important work. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one.